This episode of the podcast is brought to you by J.D. Chapman Insurance Agency. Are you an aspiring business owner or entrepreneur looking to be part of New York's multi-billion dollar cannabis industry? If so, the decisions you make in these early stages are imperative to your future success. And I'll tell you from personal experience that you will face risk on a daily basis. So it's important to have a comprehensive insurance program in place with a trusted, reliable partner. J.D. Chapman offers special insurance for cannabis growers, medical and adult use dispensaries, edibles manufacturers, testing labs, ancillary businesses, and more. Available coverage includes general liability, product liability, excess liability, and workers' comp. In this exciting and rapidly growing industry, it's important to have a partner you can trust. Contact J.D. Chapman today at 315-986-4062 for all your cannabis insurance needs. J.D. Chapman from Seed to Sale, they have you covered. The views and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to the hosts and their guests and do not reflect the views of any outside institutions unless explicitly stated. What's up, everyone? My name is Steve Vandewall, and I'm the host of Cannabis Cum Laude, a podcast devoted entirely to cannabis. This podcast will cover a full spectrum of topics, including cultivation, business, medicine, politics, culture, advocacy, and everything in between. Because let's face it, the cannabis industry is very complicated. It's robust, and it has a ton of moving parts. So it's going to be my job to help you understand it a little bit better. So tune in every week for a brand new episode. And if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you really, really, really like the show and are interested in sponsoring, please shoot me an email at logistics at cannabiscumlaude.com. Now enjoy the show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Cannabis Cum Laude. It's been a little bit, been a bit, uh, been a, on a bit of a sabbatical, but I'm excited to come back today with three very heavy hitters, uh, two are previous guests of mine on the show, and one is a new guest and a new friend. Um, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, and then we're going to talk about a very uh, comprehensive, controversial, uh, and important topic today, and that is really the biz- social equity, the business of social equity, and how that applies to the New York State CARD program. Uh, so we'll start, and we'll go counterclockwise. So My friend over here. I am Tiffany Walters, the CEO of New York State Cannabis Connect. Thank you for having me, Steve. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for having me back. I'm Rosanna. I am the owner and operator of Canna Bookkeeper. Welcome back. Hi, Steve. I'm Greg Procton. I'm the owner of G Leaf CFO. Awesome. Thanks for coming back, Greg. I'm thank really you. excited about this. We've been talking about this topic in a group text for the past week. Uh, <laughs> it really all started when Tiffany and I bumped into each other six and a half hours away in New York City <laughs> at a, the legalized NYC event. Uh, and started chatting and exchanged numbers and started talking about, you know, kind of the business and economics of social equity and the card program. And uh, she really brought to my attention uh, some really eye-opening things that we're going to take a dive into today. Uh, But first, I think it's really important to understand the foundation of what we're talking about and really what this program has been built on, and that is equity, social equity. Um, so I was looking up some definitions uh, last night, but I'd be really curious to hear how all, you know, what is, in your eyes, um, you know, what is the definition of social equity? And Greg, I'll start with you first. Uh, honestly, I mean, if you look back in time, it's a stigma that sits around, I mean, cannabis as a whole, dating back to the 20s, post-prohibition, uh, when uh, the person that was in charge, name escapes me, said, geez, we need a new villain, because if we don't have a new villain, we will... Uh, I'll lose my job, and so will the people around me. And then he started to focus on people of color. And it was it's despicable, it's disgusting to see the advertising in the 20s and the 30s leading up to this. And then it just was pushing that little boulder down the hill, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, you have full communities that are unjustly targeted. So now people are starting to realize that, hey, you know, we've been lied to for years and this is just wrong and the, these communities have been affected. So as far as social equity is the point of saying, how do we make it better? Um, you made a point earlier about, we don't know that the intentions are wrong, but certainly the rollout is wrong. You know, you're, you're not going to make everybody happy, but it, geez, at least you should 
follow through on what you're saying. Yeah. Good. Rosanna, what do you think? I mean, to, to speak to it, I think New York State has kind of changed from being equity equity involved to being justice involved. I feel like there's been a big language shift from social equity to saying justice involved. And I don't know if that's because they couldn't quite pin down what social equity was as a whole, right? Because they really, they aren't focusing on social equity as a whole. They're focusing on justice involved as social equity. That's their foundation from, from what I understand, right? So I mean, I would say that from New York State's point of view, when they say social equity, they're talking about these qualifiers where you've been convicted of something, you have, you know, a, a spouse, a child, a parent, a guardian, that kind of uh, influence or involvement. I don't think that when New York State says it, they're talking about it as like a school system issue a you know a school lottery issue they're they're not looking at it as a whole or from a macro perspective they're looking at it from this micro conviction justice involved like i don't know i feel like there could have been so much more depth to what they included and they didn't because the focus isn't social equity the focus is justice involved Hmm. interesting point Um, what do you think i i can uh agree with with rosanna the language did change um you know, when New York State first rolled out, when they first passed the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, right, the promise was that it was to right the wrongs done to the black and brown community, specifically stated that way. And um, social equity and justice involved includes so much more that um, it's not fair or impartial yet. And I know it's hard to please a lot of people, but when we go back to Uh, the prohibition of cannabis, the people that were mostly targeted, hands down, no questions asked, were black and brown people. And so if we're going to uh, right the wrong, then we need to make sure that we're focused on that and not scared to use that language or be upfront about it. You know, right now, to be a justice-involved applicant, you can be anybody in New York State as long as you have a cannabis conviction or a relative has a, a, a direct relative, right? So mom... Uh, dad son daughter type of you know so there's a lot more work to be done um i am happy that new york state you know has started the journey out by acknowledging it but there's a lot like you said more depth um to be had and uh a lot more work to be done that's why we exist new york state cannabis connect right because we're here to try to um to hold new york state accountable yeah, I, th- I think all, I really like all of your answers, actually. And I think that a, a recurring theme we've seen in the rollout of this industry is the inability to define the very language that, w- you know, has been parroted for the last couple of years. You know, I remember in a, uh, I think it was last year, I was in a seminar or a conference and somebody had posed a question to a panel about, no, it was that uh, Comedy at the Carlson had asked, I think it was Tremaine who was zooming in from Albany has said, you know, asked a question about social equity. And she said, we haven't even really figured out the definition of what that actually means yet. And I thought that's so strange considering that was the the focal point of what this whole thing is at the very least, you know, outside of business and rollout and regulation and licenses. The thing at the very least that we should have a very clear understanding is how do you define social equity? And when, you know, people of, you know, power in, uh, in, uh, that we hold in this high regard aren't in, in these departments that are responsible for rolling out, don't have that, que- that clear definition, I think all of a sudden you kind of start yourself on a, on a rocky roll, rollout to a program rollout. So, um, you know, when I start to think of equity, you know, from a business sense, and today I really do want to kind of dive into the economics and the business of social equity and what that looks like, because at the end of the day, You know, we are all plant people. We are all very passionate about this industry. But if you're in business, regardless of what industry you're in, you're in business to make money. Okay. And I think that's something that is kind of gets a lot of pushback in this industry. And Rosanna and I were chatting about this before the show is that there's this weird kind of pushback when you start talking about making money in business and scaling, like you all, all of a sudden become the bad guy if you make money in this industry. And that's just not true. Um, so I think when we're, today we're really going to understand the business of social equity and the economics. And when I think of social equity, two things have you know, come to me. Social, right? The people of New York State, you know, that's what we talk about, ownership, right? Equity in terms of a business is ownership. If I own equity in a company, I have an ownership stake in that company. So when I hear that, 
I think the people of New York should have an ownership stake in the company. Okay, that's been established. All right, let's roll into the card program because I think what we're all going to realize very clearly is that if you read between the lines, there's nothing really equitable about social equity in New York. And I think by the time where this podcast comes to a close, we're going to have a much different idea of how equity is really being presented and rolled out in the state. So number one, the card program, the conditional adult use retail dispensary program. What is the purpose of the card program? And anybody f- can feel free to take it. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, the purpose of the card program is to uh, establish a space within the cannabis industry in New York for uh, justice involved applicants, which are applicants that were previously convicted under New York State's uh, prohibition right, of cannabis in this state. And so the purpose of the card program is to uh, provide them with the, the, the capital and the space to create a, a business, uh, a retail business specifically, um, a licensed retail dispensary. So that's the purpose of it. Um, <laughs> and then we can go, go into it more, but that's the purpose. So when I was reading through, right while we got the questions, I was reading through um, New York State's statements on the purpose. And language is so, so important. And I was trying to go into everything with like a completely fresh perspective. And New York State, my interpretation of it at least, was that New York State is putting previously convicted individuals up first to speed along the process of contributing to the communities that have been underserved and over um, over policed. It was more of trying to help the community than it was trying to help the individual. And I think from New York State's perspective, they're not wrong, right? Like the taxes and the structure of the way that it's going to be given back to the community will help the communities. Um, but I don't think it's going to do anything social equity wise or like beneficially for the individual, for the actual owner. Um, I think New York State's take on it is more success from a state perspective than from a business or individual's perspective. Yeah, I think when we start looking at, you know, taxes and things like 280E, which really isn't the state's fault, you know, that's been decoupled at the state level, but it's still very uh, problematic at the federal level. You start looking at, you know, kind of the the, the real estate rollout with DASNY, um and all the that stuff. authority of the state of New York, yep. DASNA. Yeah, and we're going to get into that in a minute. <laughs> Just so you, guys know. Um, you start to realize, you know, start a lot of the, this money that's going to be made from these businesses is going to go right back out the door in the form of taxes or in the inability to write things off or to real estate. And when you look at equity and you start to dwindle those revenues, you know, far and far, you know, 50% of your revenues go back from the state or whatever that number ends up being, well, while it not, may not be ownership on the actual entity, the state might as well own 50% of your business. And if the state it, it, you know, starts to have these large contributions coming from these small businesses who are already you know, going to be, you know, are, are coming from communities and coming from lives that ha- are, you know, are going to be challenging to run a successful business in this space, I really feel like you know, you're kind of kicking them in the ankles for you know, a race that's going to be a really long race for them. Um, So really what I want to do is I want to talk about the cannabis tax code in New York, specifically uh, taxes that these retail businesses are going to be subject to when they start doing business in the legal market. And if uh, I'll throw that one to maybe any one of my CPAs over there. I'll leave it to Greg to start. Congrats. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, as you you mentioned, Steve, uh, New York separated itself from the uh, penalties of 280 at the federal level. So, I mean, yeah, sure, that's beneficial, but in the grand scheme of things, it's it's nominal. It's it's like uh, throwing a piece of candy out. It's great. It, I'm glad they did it, but the reality is, it's it's not business saving. On top of that, you have obviously excise tax, you have sales tax, you have payroll taxes. Um, on top of we're not we haven't even touched on the um, labor peace agreement that has to be made. That mm-hmm. it, in many cases. You know, you're going to have unionized workers that aren't going to be making 13, 20 an hour, or whatever the minimum wage is in the respective municipality. So they're going to be weighed down. These businesses are going to be weighed down by a myriad of taxes outside of the federal level. And the federal level is kind of the anvil that's sitting over everybody's head. And that's been my concern from the beginning and, and why I've been so passionate about helping out any entrepreneurs that are interested in doing this. Everybody sees it 
it's the wishful thinking that, you know, the perception is this is dash for the cash. We're going to get rich doing this. And you and I have spoke about it before. And the reality is there are so many traps and uh, trap doors that you're not thinking about. You know, when you take into account the the 280E impact, I mean, the excise tax is, yes, it's across the board. The other tax implications are across the board. But the reality is the compliance, not even the tax cost, but the compliance cost is significant. And it it really is a drain on these businesses. It's hard enough to have a retail store as it is, right, in today's world particularly. But then you add all the compliance and the tax implications. And it's it's painfully obvious that um, – well, from my perspective, that a lot of folks are being set up to fail, and that concerns me greatly. And let's talk about arguably the most influential, you know, thing for these retail business is the competing under under you know the competing gray market businesses that are currently thriving and going to continue to thrive. So you're right; you already have this huge burden of taxes and federal and state regulation and and, and all this stuff on top of your competing with an already successful and thriving market. It's really not a recipe for many people to succeed. Um, now, we're, you just mentioned earlier, DASNY is the dormitory authority of the state of New York. They have a large role in the rollout of this program. I think you and I discussed it at length in our last podcast. So Tiffany, if you could do me a favor and really discuss who is DASNY, what, is, what do they do as a, as a letter organization in New York State, and what are they responsible uh, in terms of the rollout of this program in New York State? So the Dormitory Authority of the State of New York controls like housing, um, uh, and they're now <laughs> controlling the leases and the spaces on card applications. And so there was a big RFP, a request for a proposal for somebody to manage the fund that Hochul put in place, or Governor Hochul, right, for the, the $200 million, which I just want to point out that only $50 million are New York State tax dollars. The rest of the $150 million have to be raised. It has not yet been raised. That's another topic. But, um, you know, so this there there's this money um, that's there, and DASNY is now picking, or they have chosen who will control this fund. They're also choosing who's going to build out the stores and what the leases are going to be. And so they have a lot of control over this program in the sense that they're making a lot of decisions that normally a business owner <laughs> who has equity in something would be making these decisions. Where's your store going to be located? What, who's negotiating the price of your lease? Um, even, I mean, there's so much that we don't know that they're controlling, right? And so then we go into um, exactly that. Like these card applicants don't get to choose where their store is. You get that store on Broadway. Like, you know, I mean, I hope you're a great business person and you can and you can uh, maneuver through that. But the fact that you don't get to choose um, that is 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 something. And then we're talking about these are loans. So now they're controlling this fund, which is loans. Let's be clear about this. Right. So all these card applicants are signing up for a loan through the through the state of New York or the dormitory authority of New York or Chris Weber's fund, whatever we're calling it. Right. And they're. Um, and they're now uh, obligated to the terms of that loan. And that doesn't automatically give you equity. It's a conditional license. Let's remember that. These card licenses are conditional. You have to meet certain metrics. So um, I think coupled with all that, it's going to be challenging for any of these applicants. And that's why we only saw 906, I think, applicants apply. Uh, because it's going to be challenging, you know. And then let's talk about that loan piece. Does everybody know the conditions of that loan? I, right? I just found out. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the condition of non-recourse, um, the interest rate is uh, <laughs> is fourteen point two five, which increased by point seven five percent on August. I mean, on September twenty second, right when the U.S. prime rate went up. So it's eight percent plus prime. I want to be clear about that because there's a lot of talk about eight percent. That's a big difference. It's almost double. Right. And 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 just so just being clear and transparent about all of this, you know, because uh, it's a lot. <laughs> and also, I mean, in our last conversation, it was not just you. You don't apply for card and then apply for DASNY. They go hand in hand. Yep. And if you get uh, if you're a winner is how New York State worded it. If you win a license. OK. <laughs> um, interesting choice of words. Uh, if, if you win a license, you have no choice in the terms. You either you agree not. or disagree and then you you're do done. Not. Right. Yeah. And it's not. I like mean, if you have a location already and you have the money, 
this is not for you. Yeah. Card is was not meant for you. Yeah. It's not for you to apply. And then you have to think about the underground market and that and that whole industry, right? And is it does it seem lucrative to them? No. no, no, not at all. <laughs> no. And so, um, and so then that's the disconnect too. Like, are are we trying to um, um, in, invite this justice involved social equity applicant to the legal market? And if we're doing so, then why why are why is all this red tape here? Why are we rolling it out in such a way? Um, it's it's not the same. And I understand that we're about our bottom line, and 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 we want to create revenue for the state. But we have to really be be thoughtful because if these businesses don't succeed, it's them. It's them that doesn't succeed. The state will still have that location. They will be able to put another card applicant right in there. They have 900 and, lined up and ready to right. go. And, and, and so um, it will be just like unless somebody succeeds, which I hope they do, because then if they succeed and they can pay back their loan, then they'll own, they'll, they'll own right, their, their business. But if they don't. Um, and these conditional licenses are for four years, right? So, and then after, I think after two, um, you can, I have to, I have to read it, but I believe after two years, you can um, apply for a traditional license. But I think the conditional part of it is there for four. Like, so it's just a, it's just, it's, it's a lot to understand. And I just hope that they, they read through and understand it. Cause these, these specific points that we're making are on the card application when you apply, right? You don't. I mean, I didn't apply for card, but nobody, um, you know, that I uh, that did it on their own without a lawyer or accountant that is just kind of doing it and paying the two thousand kind of knew this information, you know. Well, so. And Tiffany, you hit it on the head. It's all about the optics for New York State. Is look at us, look at all the good we're doing. But the reality is, again, it gets to that point. So two thousand dollars to apply. So seven hundred and fifty three or whatever it was, pay two thousand dollars with no hope. And we talked about it before we got on air is that, you know, of the of the 900 plus that applied, the chances that the, the 100 they pick or the 150 they pick are going to be cream of the crop, folks. Yeah. So the people, people that really should be getting these licenses aren't the cream of the crop, folks. The people that need the help, they need the support, not the people that for whatever reason, and, and it's no fault of their own, they're successful in their own way. They followed a path, and maybe it was a son, maybe it was a father, whatever. Um, not that they should be excluded, but the reality is the scoring system should truly be equitable and not New York's optics of, we need this to be successful. We need 150 there or 100, whatever they end up being, depending on how much money they raise. They, we need them to be successful. And if they're not successful, it's a reflection of us. And, oh, if they don't succeed, you know, I, Steve and I talked about this in the last podcast, they're just going to walk over whatever corpse is there and they're going to put somebody else there, whether it's another card applicant or just who they feel is the best option to go in that space. That's, I think, more the concern that somebody doesn't succeed. They don't care. They're not going to provide the support. That person's going to walk and have yet another mark sitting against them, right? Another hurdle that they got to live with. And, and then somebody else that is in a better position is going to take that storefront and run with it till the MSOs come in, which is a whole other conversation. Yeah, it's, you start to look at, you know, all the costs associated with this where, you know, let's say you, ha and I've heard this even before card came out, a lot of the things that people are saying, get ready, get your real estate ready, pay attention to zoning, you know, get ready. Now, if you had your real estate, it don't matter, right? You're going where the state tells you to go. And then when you go there, you're going to pay them on, a, you know, whatever their lease rate, or they're going to go to number two in line, you know? And then if you fail, which we hope none do, but ultimately will, because that's just how business works. We were talking about it on the podcast. You can, at the very least, sell your business or sell your real estate and cash in on your real estate. But guess what? You don't own that. So you what do you have to pay your loan? And back. you still got to pay your loan at, loan back. You know. And when you start looking at margin, you know, the drug business has always been very sexy because it's high margin, right? You start layering all this red tape and taxes and all this stuff. It's just a regular old business. Quite frankly, it's less attractive than a regular basis. And it starts to scare people who have been doing it and doing it well away from doing business like this because it's no longer sexy. Um, so I, I, it's one of those things where you have to figure out is like, is this just kind of ignorance at, at the highest level or not? And I don't see that in a mean way. This is complicated stuff. And I think unless you really understand the industry and have actually been participating in the industry, you can't possibly realize what it's going to take to make it work or what it's going to take to help it fail. Or is it malintentioned? I, I would have a, 
I don't want to ever believe that. Like, this is a large, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means. I would never think that there'd be this big thing to see people fail and go against a group of people, but it's happened. It's happened in history, and it's happened to the same people who are now being set up, in my opinion, to fail in this industry, uh, and it's scary. Let's follow the money, right? I mean, that's the reality. I mean, New York State ex expects to generate X billion. Hochul's campaign's been built off of that. You know, if, if she doesn't win this election, who? I mean, everything's up in the air because, well, it could be tabled for a little while, yeah. and then the lawsuits and everything else. But the reality is, you know, once once it became about the dollar, then it became big business. So New York State gets involved. DASNY gets involved, which is the epitome of big business as well, with bureaucracy on top of it. So it's all about the dollar. It's not about the it's not about the people that it's meant to take care of anymore. It's just not. It's it truly the trickle down effect of whatever profits are left. It it it's almost, I suppose it's an appropriate metaphor. Is is like New York. New York is is the Mexican cartel. You know, and then by the, the time, it, yeah, and then by the time it gets to the the street level, the the young kid that's selling just to try to buy shoes or whatever he's trying to do, um, he's making nothing, yeah. right? And that's really what the storefront is. I mean, they they've legalized the ability to do that with this card program, and even outside of the card program, it's going to be difficult. Except again, I hate to beat a dead horse, but the reality, the MSOs, I mean that that's the hurricane in the horizon that's brewing. That unless you really have an established brand and and you have some built some serious loyalty. MSOs are going to crush you, and we're going to see what happened in California is going to happen here. You know, and the, go ahead. no, and I was just going to say, and that's what's kind of you see all these sticker shops going up, and I was just it goes back to the card. Some of them have applied for card, and some of them haven't. They like recently opened, and they're doing it because they think that they don't know what's happening with card, right? And and so there's talk that if you have a location that you might be chosen if they can't get their locations together because they don't have all the locations for all of the, the different card applicants, although they know how many retail stores are going to go in locations. They don't have it all. They haven't built them all out. They don't even have the funds, right? And so all of these are talks and people are hearing this and they're getting nervous. So now you have these card applicants possibly wasting thousands if not hundreds of thousands depending on where these locations are right of money like to try to get a a, a a head start on something that they didn't even they don't even really know like it's just so to boot in the application part of their attestation is that they will not participate um in the sale of illicit or anything new york state deems as illegal cannabis so from the moment you sign and pay your application fee you are saying, signed to New York, I am not lying to you. Here are the things I agree to in this process. As soon as you send your application and you are in process. So now if you're a card applicant and you have a sticker shop, you, you just threw away your card application if you get caught. And now it's, a, and it's I believe so it's a one year. Yeah, I believe it's a one year penalty until you can reapply. But card, but you may not even be able to and reapply. They, and they them. don't, and they, they don't know that. They're just like, it's not being enforced. So even if they do know that, they're like, it's not being enforced. Nobody's coming. Like, I literally just watched a news episode yesterday of a, of a store, and they just did. They were like, well, it's not being enforced. You know? It was the guys out in Brooklyn, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the name of the store? It was um, Big Chiefs. Chief, Big Chiefs. Yeah, yeah. They, and the comments, right? Like, why are you on the news? But um, it's not just them. We see, <laughs> we see, we see Empire Cannabis. We see them here locally. They're I've seen bald. them at our festivals. Yeah. I've seen them, you know? Um, and these are, like, legit festivals, like the Lilac Festival. You know, like, they're out there. Yeah. And I think it makes it hard because they want to be a part of that legal industry and they want to create a path for themselves. They don't want New York controlling everything for them. And I think that that's what, you know, I heard this. I was recently um, in New York City at the event that we met at <laughs> and um, and Shice Bubs, you know, he said that this industry should be built around them, the current market, the people who are doing it. Right. Instead of like creating this whole nother like industry basically right and you want people to conform to that industry the way you created it but it's being very it's been very successful and will continue to be the way it's created right now so why don't we work within that right it's also been very dangerous though it it ha it has been and so we need uh, and I shouldn't we still want to make it legal so what that means comes security right yeah. and we're talking about that too so I say that to say that it, not the same way but implementing some of those those ways and the methods like how when you go to New York everybody's outside on the 
corner like a vendor <laughs> selling cannabis, right? Should should there be a vendor license? Like, I mean, when you think about other things and how economies work and industries work in New York, there's a lot of things that we can um that we can mimic, that we can take even from the underground. And so they have to be more connected with that market. They're not. And so the things that they're creating aren't enti- enticing. They're just not. Not to the people that are running. The people that are running the underground market don't need money for a storefront. I think that that is what New York State has a, that's where they have a void in knowledge, right? Is they know that they don't know, but they don't know how much they don't There's know. There's levels to There's this. a <laughs> lot of zeros <laughs> underground that New York State does not have a clue about, and they never will. And that's not going to change. And I think that the the less appealing the legal market is, right, the way it's written right now, it's not very appealing. Uh, it's just going to continue to grow the illicit market, the underground market. I do think that retail has a place in normalizing Mm -hmm. and bringing people that are not comfortable going into somebody's basement or into somebody's house or to one of our festivals. Like it's a lot. Um, I think that there's there's a space for that, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's where a the retail space comes in. Right. But I think that the Dasney card is a joke. I think that New York State should have just taken their $50 million and put it towards safe banking instead. Mm-hmm. Like I think that would have been a better use. And I mean, they wouldn't have had the, the shield of saying equity and yeah. that they're doing this first and they're putting these people ahead. But like safe banking is going to put people ahead. Safe banking is what we need. We don't need to focus on you know, your personal financials and getting into X, Y, and Z, your personal financials, that's part of banking, right? Like if you're an illicit market, you've been underground, you don't have, you haven't been allowed to have financial records. Right, let's talk about amnesty, right? How about that? Like um, that would have changed a lot of things if if they would give amnesty. People, you know, so until that happens. (laughs) But New York State has claimed their own. If you read through the card application, they have claimed that they have nothing to do with anything written on the paper other than that they are like a middleman. They have no liability. They release themselves from everything. Like, But then you have the mentorship program that focuses on particularly agriculture, right? And so then it's like, well, you say that, but then you don't want me to talk about it. Like, it can't be a part of me applying and like there's a lot of people that know how to do things that don't have a traditional chemistry background that don't have a traditional agriculture background they've never taken courses or classes but they can they can grow some great cannabis right and so um again it goes back to the language yeah they well in in the application they give the um applicant an option to do a personal history disclosure and i think that that is where new york state expected people to be like i've been secretly a chemist in my basement and yeah. growing and I'm like an agro specialist. Yeah. But I mean, how many of those 903 do you think had an honest Blow personal? Themselves in. Yeah, yeah, right. With no amnesty, like you said, like, I don't know, Steve, it points to, it points to asking people to, to like self-incriminate. Yeah. This seems trappy a little bit. Well, and and it's our, we're coming from this underground. It's already like a whole trust yeah. issue type of thing. Right. So I, I just don't think that they would. I know it's you, you, you know, there's people out there that I think that are operating really good businesses right now that have been and are, who are starting to come more to the surface mm-hmm. and show their faces and their operations. And I think that, you know, if the state could have, they've really overcomplicated this like tremendously. I mean, I could really understand if we were the first state to roll it out and we were flying by the seat of our pants. I could get it. 16th, I think we were to roll out. There's plenty of case studies of what's worked, what happened, or what hasn't. States like California, who has objectively been a dumpster fire, it seems <laughs> like we're oddly trending in that direction. It's like, I just feel, I don't know what it's going to take, and I don't know if it's even possible just the way that this, the state of New York is set up. You know, this is a naturally very overregulated red tape state yeah. in an extremely overregulated industry. I don't know if it's ever possible in the near, near future for it to be treated like a regular business. But man, if they really, if you just took what, you know, look at craft beer and wine, there's always going to be your Anheuser-Busch's of any industry. We just have to accept that. There's going to be big players that come in. And let's not forget, generational wealth can be built on a couple ways. One of them is buyouts, right? Are we seeing some of these egregious buyouts of brands and small businesses and just IP? 
PCP in general. I'm telling you right now, if I was a, 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 a cannabis business owner in a small brand and somebody offered me $50 million for I, my IP, where do I sign? Yeah. That's generational wealth. So we have to, in some respect, embrace the big money that's coming over here because that's how big, that's how generational wealth is built. You know, the other side of the coin is, yeah, you can build a business over, you know, decades and, you know, there's two ways, you know, but if we really just, you know, kind of took the, you know, the, the, the shackles off the businesses and uh, let these small craft businesses come in, if you want to put a, uh, uh, um, um, a limit on square footage, your plant count, fine. Right. If, but at some point, small, good, small businesses are going to become big businesses and we can't prevent that. If I start in my basement and I'm growing fire and in five years I'm growing fire out of a warehouse, well, let me grow fire out of a warehouse because I'm making money, you're making money and providing jobs. We shouldn't prevent small businesses from becoming big, successful businesses. So I don't know. I think the reality is, is there's not enough advocacy and megaphoning that we could do for them to change their minds and see it our way. I think the the market and the gray market and the market that's running right now, until they see those Financial reports year to year. Oh, we missed our mark. Oh, 50, 50 businesses went underground. $10 billion is still being made in the underground market. The market will is the de determining factor that's going to ultimately prevail. I just hope it happens sooner than later. So you made a good point, Steve. The, the reality that these smaller businesses have a chance to be bought out, right, and create generational wealth. Your other point, New York's not going to change until they kick themselves in the face, right? So what can we do to help the successful card applicants that aren't the cream of the crop necessarily, that don't have all the resources to be successful? How do we help them get to the point to build their brand, to build their foothold, so that when an MSO or somebody below an MSO comes in with that big paycheck, approaches them, right? And just doesn't try to squash them. They say, well, they're doing a hell of a job. Yeah. We, want, we want what they're doing and we're going to buy them out and get them the generational wealth that way because New York can't take that. Yeah, they can they pay off their lease or they pay off their loan or whatever the heck it is with New York State and they walk away and they walk away with real money. Yeah. So, how do we help those folks? I mean, ancillary is the answer to me, right? It, set up a killer complimentary ancillary business for your brand. Like what if you have a killer merch line and and that's your thing and you also have you know, you have your bud, but in MSO, if somebody comes in and buys you out, they don't care what you're growing. They're not going to keep your seeds. Well, They're not going to keep doing what you were doing. Yeah. They're just or, taking your name. They want your market. And your or, name. Or, yeah. a, or a product, right? Um, I, I'll say this. I, I So, um, John, I met John. He is the owner and CEO of Pinners in Canada, and he owned a data company before he owned Pinners, right? And it got so big that a company bought him out. And I said, when you created this company, did you think that you would be selling it like that was that your goal right he was like no <laughs> they offered me so much money my eyes watered yeah. <laughs> but there's ways you right? can set up your and business so, to be bought out well well what i what i'm saying to that is uh, he created this brand that's still existing a company bought out he got money he was able to invest in himself in another product right like you said creating something else so having that other business um, especially if it is involved in cannabis, may be very good for you. Maybe it's just a product that you get to, you know, brand and people love, yeah. you know, um, whether it's um, a CBD cream, whatever it is, if you brand yourself, that that's a way, right? Because now your product uh, can be sold in retail stores and all of the retail stores too. So, you know, it's, it's things like that, ancillary, um, you know, uh, we are, we're doing a whole career summit. We're talking about the careers that surround uh, cannabis right now with cultivation and processing. I mean, if you can do, if you have like a background in construction or something and you can like move things, heavy lifting, right? Um, with the cultivation, it's just like havoc, helping them set up their rooms, plumbing, you know, fertigation. Like these are things where you can create generational wealth for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not directly touching cannabis, but you're a plumber that specializes in that or you can do that type of setup, right? So you're helping them set up their hydroponic spaces. Havoc, you can come in and help them set up a controlled environment, right? Um, and now <laughs> you're doing this for years. Your kids can get into it. And these, you know, so just thinking about it like that. But back to what what. Greg was saying, I think that um, it's about making sure that they have the proper um, programs, you know, edu education, helping create that. What does it mean to, to manage your books? 
for a business, right? What are the certain things that you need to to meet in order to stay in compliance and keep your license? Maybe it's not focusing on card applicants. Maybe it's focusing on preparing the state or, or the community in the state all the rest of the people that want applications because eventually it's going to open up and anybody's going to be able to ap apply. Mm -hmm. And right. And we want those business owners to be armed with the best knowledge, you know, and the best resources so that they can succeed. Um, the, the card applicants, they'll still be there and the state is responsible for giving them the resources and the programs that they need to succeed. The state is taking it on. So for the rest of the applicants, when we have micro businesses, when we have delivery, when we have co-ops, when we have on-site consumption, let's focus on um, creating programs so that those business owners can make sure that they succeed because they're not going to be under conditional licensing. I mean, to me, that screams continued professional education requirements. Yeah. I have C I have CPE requirements. Do you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most fields that most professional fields require continued education, yeah. and I don't. I mean, even hairstylists require continued yeah. education. It it makes sense to maintain compliance from the state's perspective in the most effective, efficient, and uniformed way. So okay. New York State should build the program that educates. I mean, it's in their best interest for people to succeed and be yeah. compliant. Because if if I have a store and I bail and I owe the state two million. They may never see that two million, but if they if they help support me and provide those yeah. and re make it a requirement of the license mm -hmm. that you know you're required to get forty hours or whatever it is yeah. of exposure to this, that makes sense. Whether they do it or not, because it makes sense, is a whole other animal. But right, right. But I mean, even it's voluntary compliance, right? That's what New York State needs is voluntary compliance because they don't want to come into this industry guns blazing full force going for compliance because they are just going right back at the BIPOC black and brown people mm -hmm. that they have been coming at from the start. So, I mean, to me, that would make the most sense is for New York State to contract out a continued education program. And like, what an amazing thing to be able to contract out to another group of small businesses. And you know what I mean? Just like continue to build the network. And it helps with the, the entrepreneur or the mm -hmm. person who's running that business, right? When you think about, like you said, as a hairdresser, you have to take certain um, a compliance or trainings every year. When you own a salon, it's nice to know that you don't have to do those trainings. You can go and choose a training that's state certified through an organization, right? You do that training and now your employer only has to reinforce the training that you have. So just setting up those things to make it easy as possible for, for workforce development, for development of these legacy individuals, for them, that is kind of setting them up for the paper trail that they need, yes. right? Um, or that that I shouldn't say need, but that people want to see, right? So um, I think it builds this this stronger foundation and infrastructure. So training is at the core. And when I'm talking about training, I'm not just talking. Obviously, we're we're not talking about just plant touching and how to mm -hmm. cultivate weed. We're talking about training for health and safety, yeah. right? OSHA, how is this handled? Yeah, yeah. Whether you're in delivery or your distribution or you're at the cultivation center, it's going to be different. But there needs to be a certain standard there. And I think that's what we all hoped for. As a, you know, as a consumer of cannabis in New York, that there would be some type of standard that that's what at least would would happen. Right. Is that we'd always get bomb weed. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. If you want bomb weed, right. you got to stay underground. Yeah. It's going to be a while. That's all we want. Right. Like, let's be honest. Yeah, that's it. That's all we want. So good weed. <laughs> Now it, it would it seems like it would make the most sense for this new mentorship program to cover a lot of this, you know, uh, continuing. To be honest, I'm a little bit I, I I'm a little bit uneducated on the mentorship program. Can anybody give me kind of a quick synopsis on the mentorship program and if that is something is continuing education as a pillar of this program? So yeah, from what I can understand from OCM and, and speaking to them, Damian Fagan and, and and people in the office, is that it is it is going to be a continual thing that they're creating different programs to target different demographics, and um and that this is just kind of one of many. And so the mentorship program um, rolled out, I believe, on the twenty. Oh, don't give me, I. I can't remember the exact date, but it did just open. If you go to New York State Cannabis .com or <laughs> NYSCannabisConnect.com, you can find it there. But um, it it is a 10 week program and you you have to apply for it. They're only choosing between 200 and 250 people. Um, it is not a guarantee that you'll get a license in the future if you take it, but they state that it does increase your chances. And what it all is is compliance. 
and paperwork. So it is not a mentorship program on how to grow cannabis. It is literally about New York State's compliance and their regs and to kind of give them a background on that. Uh, You know, I guess where I feel like I'm disappointed in the program is that if it is virtual and online, why are we limiting it to 200 to 250 people? Um, We keep creating these niche, (laughs) these niche uh, uh, you know, um, pools of P- of 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 applicants, candidates, and and I don't understand why. What I understand is because we want people to succeed, but I think there's so many more people that could succeed, and that we're just like keeping them out for yeah. no for no reason. If it's virtual, why can't five thousand New Yorkers take it if they want to? When you look at, I mean, how many New Yorkers? How what's our population in New York? That's like I mean, a drop in the. Not even. Do you trust that New York would be able to provide accurate information on the first run? So is this just a test group? I think they know. I think they provide act, uh, accurate how to pay your taxes appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I was just about to say, <laughs> I don't, I don't even else. know if it's, about, if it's appropriate or not. It's kind of like it's since they're creating it and they're maybe, you know, they're they're giving people the idea that it's going to put them at an advantage. It just seems so... You know, if you're not one of the people that get it, then here you are, you know, swirling your mind on how you're going to to get into cannabis. And it, and it is weird because I don't know what. So is the mentorship program for the next round of card. But is there a next round of card? Is it a mentorship program for when you apply for a traditional retail license? Like what? You know, because it's compliance for cultivation and processing. It's specifically for cultivation and processing. So it just. That's another thing. It's not for a retail either. So I don't even know it's hard. It's well, not for a card. It's I mean, for processing a retail. Compliance for retail and compliance in agriculture are totally different. Right. So it makes sense that they would isolate them and keep them separate. So maybe they are doing this for uh, agriculture and processing because those are the next regular licenses. I, or gonna maybe go? the sales tax or the THC tax is going to go away and they don't want to train people on it yet. That'd be great. Well, that yeah, that's. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to get an yeah. uptick here. Yeah, We've thanks. Been we need it. Down. Yeah, yeah. Just... yeah. <laughs> Those taxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, can, about that, I was just thinking about this the other day, and it's kind of a little bit off topic of what we're talking about. But they, you know, the packaging. Rec- why would you create a THC tax if you're going to put THC limits? Right? Doesn't that if you isn't there like a hundred milligram per package? maximum for products like i just don't understand why if you're going to put thc limits on a product you're also going to have a thc tax because new york state wants to encourage low dose um consumption but doesn't that mean that you can't eat you're not even legally allowed to have above 100 milligrams well it's or? it's 25 per individual item okay or, from my last reading this may mm-hmm. have been updated since per 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 gummy unit let's say yeah per, per unit yep, and then 100 milligrams per pack um but you can also have bulk packaging, but everything needs to be individually packaged, like now and later's, right? So, like, you can't have a gigantic bag of gummies, of, of bulk gummies, right. but you can have a gigantic bag of individually wrapped items, from my understanding. That's interesting. Up to, I think it might be like 1,500 milligrams per... But they all have to be, like, individually wrapped? Mac, yeah, or if it's, uh, like... Say you buy like something that would be like a candy bar. It has to be clearly identified what a serving size is. It cannot just be a hash in the bar. Yep. Um, and I, I want to say that it limits one serving size to 20 or 25 milligrams. Interesting. No, I don't think that's, ter- I don't think that's terrible. I do. <laughs> well, if you're talking more if, than one. Well, yeah, well right. But, <laughs> yeah. and now, right, but now we're talking, I mean, I don't know. I just think under, I, it's really easy to build a tolerance to 20 milligrams, folks. Yeah. That happens they want fast. they want microdosing. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's well, I mean like I want control. everyone to be microdosed. What an amazing <laughs> yeah, world! Yeah, well, okay, Slow well. down, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start but, fortifying well. our food with it. <laughs> 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 it's the kind of GM or the genetic engineering I want, right? Yeah. 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 Please add cannabinoids to GMO. Yeah, right. All milk now comes with like two percent THC, <laughs> and like this would be great. I want my cows high as <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That would be marketable. These ca- these cows were stred- fed strictly hemp and high THC. <laughs> food Imagine feed. the Kobe right. beef. Yeah. Right. Hey, we right. massaged them. Right. We sang to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really infused. <Yeah. laughs> this is our million dollar idea, folks. Yeah. This Guys, is we got to go. We got his business to start. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to talk about, you know, we were talking a lot about uh, deadlines. Um, <laughs> it is election season. Uh, Governor Hochul, even though we're not super thrilled with the rollout of the program, I, I do say we can all we could probably all agree on that she's worked much more expeditiously <laughs> than former Governor Cuomo. Yes. Um, has it been done perfectly? No, but I don't know if there's anybody that could really do it perfectly. But with election coming up, I think November 4th or November 6th, we're hearing, you know, a lot of campaign promises. And one of them is going to see we are going to have 20 card dispensaries open by the first of the year. Now, my first thought is, well, what about the other 150 that went out? <laughs> okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But with what we were talking about earlier, right, Dasney's in charge. There's big money involved, which really hasn't even been, you know, this 150 or $200 million, there's only been $50 million pulled in. And that is that is there money in an account somewhere with New York with $50 million? No, they're still are, trying to find a bank. There's still not even a bank that <laughs> there's will... There's not a bank. There was two. Two banks there, applied. Well, there were two banks, but they don't first... Uh, five star, and I can't remember the other one. But but from my understanding is they don't even think that they're qualified to handle the amount of uh, uh, audits that they're going to get from the federal yeah. government no because these are di they're directly paying. <laughs> in Would the not cannabis. want that problem. So so they're like, and um, kudos to them because they applied, and I know yeah. <laughs> five star bank, and they are like a, a smaller bank, but the, the New York State doesn't think they'll, they'll be able to to handle it. So I don't know if they'll get picked, but yeah. So we're still in this dilemma where things aren't solidified. We have fifty million dollars of state money. Um, I guess that could go far depending on where they pick the stores, right? If there's none opening in Broadway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, you know, they're kind of spread out and not directly in the city, that might be enough to open 20 stores. Um, but then you go back to the card applications and the scoring. They don't even have a company to do the scoring on that. Uh, I talked to some card applicants. They said that they were giving them till the 30th to turn in their 2000. A lot of them were confused on if they had already turned in their money. Did that mean that their application was still sitting until the rest of the people turned in their money? So it just a lot of unanswered questions. I, I'm hopeful that would be a great Christmas gift. I think never. I, I just don't know how it's 60 days from now. How are they going to finalize the money, finalize the bank, finalize the point system and the contractor that's going to do it, select the locations, build the locations, get them in, get the product 60 days. Security so trains your people, get your POS. So they've already yeah. started building stores and doing contracting. They have okay. started some of it. But no official contracts have been signed or named. Well, so mm. there's talk. Juicy gossip. <laughs> yes. There's, there's Breaking news. <laughs> I, I, I won't give names, but there's definitely talk. So I think that they're they're further along with some of those stories than we might think. I saw that they were, you know, there's leasing going in a few months ago. And, you know, so like August, July. So there is a possibility that some stores could have been built out by now. Um Although <laughs> I know that they haven't revealed uh, all their contracts and revealed? things like that, <laughs> they haven't told us the yeah. deeds. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, but but I don't. I do. I don't. I don't think that the stores will be open by the end of the year. I think that that when they first said it a few months ago to us, that that was an honest answer from them. It was the best honest answer that they have given. You know, since the beginning, it's like they rushed this. At first, we were like, it's gonna take two years. Right. For them to even roll this stuff out. And then immediately, I mean, things just started rolling out. And I know part of it is to do, you know, with Governor Hochul being in 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 her position. And I'm happy that she started appointing people immediately. Yeah, she did. Right. Um, uh, but in the reality is most of those people haven't been in their position a year. You know, I mean, Chris Tremaine, but most of those other people haven't. And they're still understaffed. Yeah. So, um, no, <laughs> I don't have faith. Maybe one store. <laughs> well, you still got to get two. supply. <laughs> right. I mean, well, that's, where's, where's the supply going to no, You got to get it tested. Then, you know, process. Good good supply. Well, supply. Where's, oh, right. Transpo? Right. where's Transpo? Where's Transpo? Delivery. Nobody Anybody? has delivery yep. licenses. No, yeah. don't, right. even, don't even have knowledge of right. how Transpo is going right. to work. Right. It's true. Only that they're, you can be licensed. You can't have another license and you can have up to 25 drivers. That's basically all I know. Yeah, and it, like, let's pretend and let's hope that they do get twenty licenses, and there's twenty businesses that can get out there by year one and start killing it. Let's hope. Let's hope that, right? Optimistic, Steve. There's two hundred. How many? How many cultivation licenses are there? Two hundred and sixteen. So that's two hundred theoretically two hundred and sixteen acres of weed. You know, a lot of it will go to extract. A lot of it will go to flower. Then you got seventeen processors who are going to need substantial amounts of biomass to make edibles and all that. Twenty stores. I mean. 
there's still going to be an incredible oversupply of product. I mean, I can't imagine and the shrinkage. That, well, well, there's yeah. there's another issue at play too. It was right. published in the New York Cannabis Insider yesterday. But there's a real concern on the testing requirements for uh, yeast and mold that the limits in New York that New York State has set up for an outdoor grower are unrealistic. Wow. And that there are a number of these cultivators are concerned that their product's going to be rejected because it's not going to meet those standards. Now, other states have raised it from whatever it was, 10,000 to 100,000, but New York hasn't yet. So that's a real concern, too. Jeez. Yeah, it's capped at 10,000 right now, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It and is. It's, we're talking about outdoor oh, grow. In New York right. State. <laughs> right. Ooh, and was wow. anyone here this summer? For Did anyone experience this summer? Like, everyone that grew was talking about mold issues. I saw so much powdery mildew this year. It was almost like everybody that I knew was growing up. Oh yeah, I got some PM and it's just like, you know, on top of other issues. I mean, literally I remember, I think it was September 21st was like 75 or 80 and beautiful. And fall was September 22nd. And there was like a 30 degree, it literally went from summer to fall overnight. And then you it had did. some really cold days and some hot days and all this crazy weather change and rain during harvest. I mean, that's a recipe for botrytis. It's a recipe for mold. It's a recipe for crop failure. And it's, if you have these low, you know, mold, these low thresholds, man, I mean, it's just, I, I worry. It's going to be, I feel like it's going to be a real challenge. I mean, it is. It's nice that New York has a little health and safety concern, but that's not the health and safety. I'm more concerned with getting shot or getting my yeah. things robbed from my farm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right. Which is also safety. happening. Which is happening yeah. right now. Farms are getting robbed. Yeah, and that's so, the health and safety New York State needs to be concerned with right now. Yeah. Shrinkage. And I think we need to talk about that, about awareness, right? These these farms are getting robbed. And so um, they need to be aware. They need to have some best practices and... Um, and start and, and start figuring it out, you know, um, and, and also st stop letting people tour your farms like yeah. until you got your stuff in order. You know, honestly, there were other organizations, but I just want to put it out <laughs> oh there. New God. York State Cannabis Connect did not do any tours. We have not toured any New York farms um, <laughs> over Croptober. Uh, we're giving you all your safety <laughs> and your distance. But um, no, it's really sad. And so we're actually at New York State Cannabis Connect. We're actually working to try to help these farmers because we do think that they've been hit hard. Um, just with everything. They don't know when they're even going to be able to sell this product. <laughs> so let's figure out how we can, you know, uh, dry it, you know, cure it and, and get it uh, in some good uh, packaging <laughs> and storage so that you can, you know, have some actual product. Because think about that, too, the shrinkage. Now it sits for a few months or whatever. You go back to weigh that, you go, you know, there's shrinkage, right? All these things are going to come into play for this these farmers. And I feel... Go ahead. And I was going to say, because well, doesn't that dry weight versus wet weight play into the THC content as well? So mm -hmm. wouldn't that affect the THC tax down the road? It does. So New York State, drag your feet. You're just going to get less of a THC tax. <laughs> but it's a product that has a shelf life. It does. Right? So how long does it take to get from like dried and cured to the lab processed and then a report back to you on whether right. you can package and produce? Or do you package and produce and just hope for the best? Well, yeah. I guess that's the thing, too, when you think about it. This is all a system, and you bring up some great points, because then you talk about the labs and the processing. Do we have enough? Do we have a, enough labs and processing to even accommodate all of this, even the, the ramifications that could happen with the mold and, and all that? Do we have enough processing plants that are capable of doing it? Like, it just it's all... In a timely way. In a timely way. Yeah. In a timely way, even to get a product on the shelves before the end of the year, right? Like... New it's York State definitely be... has safeguards in place for it with like, you need to keep your client records for three years, you need to know the THC content, all of your coding and UPCs, like they have a compliance system in place to react, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't have anything in place right now to like prevent and is, I mean, the big talk was plant tracking and metric. And is, is that even it? happening? Are people it's using not metric. metric? It's not metric. It's bio track. Right? Bio track. Yeah. Bio -track. Oh, really? Is it like full? Is that part of the, you know, are these cultivators, these 250 cultivators supposed to be using this program, whatever it is, or? I don't work in cultivation. Hmm. I, I honestly don't. Not I'm sure. assuming they should. I'm assuming. Yeah. I just haven't heard much about it. I, I haven't either. If you're a cultivator, let us know. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> what are you know. using? Right. That's How's like it going? It? Yeah. Do yeah. you like it? Who's your rep? How do we find out? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's a yeah. good that's a good question. Now wasn't there supposed to be there was talk of bringing supply from the medical dispensary market to help support uh new card new card stores? Yeah. That sounds uh, like <laughs> diversion. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that never happens for me. So don't legal say that. Diversion. I yeah. love. Just right? in case everything goes to shit, we got plenty of MSO products to get your back. Don't, don't worry. you worry. Is Follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. They're all releasing new products. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you just hope it's craft. I do. I hope that um, New York State just keeps doing what they're doing. Literally, the underground cultivators and creating great products and craft. That's where we're going to succeed in the legal market, you know, is when they come up with their specific strands and it's theirs and and we love them um, because everything else is, you know, especially in their stores, I think it's going to kind of be more generic, uh, <laughs> kind of what we see from the MSOs. Yeah. <laughs> we don't see diversion with them because they don't have, you know, flashy graphics or great product. I mean, even if their products are good, they just don't have the same marketing and stuff. So it's the demographic is different too. Well, they're yeah, they're totally trying to reach a different demographic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like they want they want the people that are going to leave their nine to five, you know, hop in their Volkswagen and drive to the dispensary yeah, and get their me. joint for yeah. the <laughs> right and feel and feel safe and feel and feel yeah. safe and comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you that is one of the reasons. You know, going into a legal dispensary does feel good. There is a tax, <laughs> but you 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 know that the product you're getting is tested. It's a good product, you know. But do you? Um. Well, how many recalls have we I, seen this year? I'm not going to well, say in New York. After the fact, too. I'm, I'm not going to. I've never shopped in New York State because I don't have a medical license. So I don't have a medical <laughs> license in New York State, but I've shopped in California, Illinois. I make my rounds. <laughs> um, and those products are, are great. But um, no, you know, and that's another thing. Now the medical program is open um, and people can grow at home, too. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're a part of the medical program. So um, that's interesting. I'm actually happy for that right now. Are I, you? Well, I'm happy that yeah, I I am. I'm happy that people can can grow at home. I just hope they understand what they're doing. I'm happy that things are changing in New York. Yeah. I know that as a adult use, you can't um, just recreationally grow for what is it six months after or 180 days, six months after the first sale. Yeah, it's something like in New York 100, State. 180 days after yeah, the first sale. Yeah, I think it's 180 days after first sale. So then we can grow, <laughs> but then it's gonna change. <laughs> it is gonna change the whole. You know, that's going to change the marketplace, too. I mean, will it, though? Because I, I mean... I'm going to grow so that I don't have to pay that tax. Yes, I, I am. Are, well, okay. <laughs> right. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? Like, uh, as a consumer and, like, whatever, I'll go full disclosure. I don't care. I grew this summer, and I grew for the first time. And I'm, I I probably grew all moldy weed and didn't know. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted to, to bring it today this. and look at it. it. No, I'm just no, no, but this is what I'm <laughs> saying, right? Like, as somebody that consumes, yeah. I see it all the time. I right. touch it all the time. I know the, the issues and the, the concerns that come with it. And I still was looking at it, and I was like, well, I'm probably going to smoke it anyway. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're going to smoke it. <laughs> I love you. you are going to throw it out? You're going to smoke it, yeah. It's, it's filler. It's I will yeah. tell you that we, if, if you're... <laughs> If you're, if you're, a kin I'm a consumer, like I've been consumer since my teens, right? And so I know I've smoked some dirty trash weed. Like we used to call it like backyard, like just trash weed, right? Yeah. Then came the hydro, right? Um, and then just all these, right? But now we're in a stage that, oh, Rosanna, um, I don't grow outside. <laughs> I definitely control my growing conditions. I have a gorilla tent. Shout out to gorilla tent. Um, you know, control conditions because then you prevent mold. <laughs> because you, that. because you knew. Right, we're right. Well, and and shout out to anybody who wants to grow legally right now. Go grab Jorge, Jorge Saventis, but grab it. Literally, uh, Glenna, Glenna CBD, Glenna is literally teaching that book in her class. I learned on that book. That book is the Bible <laughs> of cannabis. It's a great starting point. You're not going to learn everything in there because plants are so unique. You really have to learn your plant and, you know, read your plant and, and understand your plant. Plants are living things. Um, you know, outside of cannabis, if you have a plant taking care of it, you know, you see, you're like, oh, a little less water, you know, <laughs> don't kill it. But um, with some, with some, it was your first time. You keep growing and you grow some great product you'll be proud of. Yeah, and Steve but will like, be like, I could also put myself in the hospital for having consumed moldy Right, flour. if you didn't, yeah. no, right. And I also... Get your stuff tested, people. If you're growing and you don't know what you're doing, please, even if you do know what you're doing, it's great to get your stuff tested. If you're doing great and you don't even know how much, you know, how much your terps, your yeah. THC. I don't even want to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of, equivalent to like a tomato. <laughs> yeah. Think about the shit that we've smoked in all of our years being consumers, you know, back before you could, you know, buy good stuff locally. I mean, I can't, I'm, that the brick weed and the spray right, shit and like... Gary Payton did not exist uh, no, until, no, yeah. No. <laughs> not in my world, at least, for no. a while. 
I will say, speaking of lab testing, shout out to Dr. Brandy Young yes. of Certainty Analytical Lab. She was on the show recently. She has an awesome little boutique lab. Uh, she's doing uh, downtown cannabis. Rochester. Downtown. We're very lucky to have yeah. a testing lab in the heart of Rochester. I mean, I can't, I, I can't uh, express how lucky we are because that is going to be and is arguably one of the most uh, uh, biggest bottlenecks in most legal industry. And to have that right in the heart of Rochester is huge. She's doing small. If you are a grower, if you are, it's an, an R and D based thing. You don't necessarily have to disclose what you're doing, but she At will. All. She will test mm -hmm. for you regardless if you have a license or not. And I think that's super responsible. And I hope other labs around the state are doing the same thing. And we're we're partnering up with Doctor Doctor Young because we want to start um, a strand a strand directory for New York specifically mm. for New York strands. So if you guys got strands, please allow her to put it in our yep. directory. You guys have to. Um, to check that off because you do own uh, your your sample and your results. So uh, yeah, and just know that that is safe. I like that Steve shouted that out because it is safe. So anybody could get their stuff tested. So yeah, keep that in mind if you want to know what you're what you're actually smoking. And it's marketable. If you pull, you know, I'm not a big. Uh, I don't grow or pick products for THC. Um, really, I pick them for terps. But if you have a product, you know, there is a market for high THC stuff and terpenes, whatever. If you have a product that is Quanti you can say quantifiably, look at how much THC or look at my terpene percentage. That's value, right? That is a, that is a marketable piece of information. Uh, and you can prove that you have good quality weed. So it, it really say, is valuable. You can prove that and a standard, right? Yep. So if you're doing this every single time you're, you're harvesting and you're taking in and you're getting your test, look at that. Now you've created yep. this paper trail for yourself that shows that you can create yep. A standard, a standard quality of wheat, which is dope. Same so. thing for edibles too. I mean, edibles. We, I think we've all talked about this. Is like most people have a grossly overinflated tolerance of what their their edible tolerance actually is. You know, you buy these five hundred or thousand milligram <laughs> gummy bears, you eat the whole pack, and you catch a nice buzz. You're like, wow, here's my tolerance. I have a thousand milligram tolerance. No, but you then, don't. if you actually eat a thousand milligrams and you wind up in the ER and having a mental breakdown, no, it's because your tolerance is a hundred milligrams. That's just what your real tolerance is. So when you have, if you're an edible product or you are, make cartridges, if you can say, listen, my gummies or my chocolates have 25 milligrams per container you know you can really provide you know it's really uh, especially important in the edible space um because a lot of people don't really understand what their tolerance is they've never had real market products and people want consistency they want quality um so long story short get your shit tested there is a big difference though even when you're talking about tolerance between full spectrum and and non Certainly. right like if i a distillate edible is very different than if somebody gives me I don't know. What? A hash rosin edible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Please give me a hash rosin edible. You must. <laughs> <laughs> that is how you find out your tolerance. You, we're going to manifest that. There might be something waiting for you all in the car after uh -oh. this. So. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, but even knowing the differences between those things, like resin and rosin, they're two different things. I've yep. gone into a dispensary, and she was like, oh, you mean resin? And I was like, oh, no, I mean rosin. <laughs> And she was like, oh, no, I've never heard of that. And I was like, you're a fucking dispensary. <laughs> yeah, Shout out to Rosanna for bringing that point up. Education is the foundation. Yep. Education is power. Yep. Knowledge is power, right? Come to our website, you guys. Yeah. Tune in, to, tune in to shows like this. Stay abreast of what OCM is doing. You know? Steve, you crush it with, with product knowledge. You really yeah. do. And Thank your you. process and Appreciate why it's that. important. Um, I love it. That's I I saw he was doing a reel on the importance of knowing your tolerance, right? I think that that's more too what the state is doing. They're like, don't smoke and drive, don't overconsume, don't leave your cannabis off for your kids. Great, we know we know that stuff. We've been consuming New York, <laughs> but how about those things that people don't know? Where you're transitioning from this underground market <laughs> to this legal market? What are the things that you should know? A lot of people don't know the difference between indica, sati, any of these things. They don't care. They've been shopping with their local guy. They get it. They roll it up. They smoke it. They make their butter. They do whatever, but they don't know the fundamentals. It's crazy how many people have literally been lifelong consumers and don't know anything about the product. Yep. And so now is a great opportunity to educate the masses on this product and like there's a whole new demographic that's coming out they just want the information they're not the, the um my coo jamani his mom you know she, thank god she just got over cancer treatment but she did not um she didn't she didn't like cannabis at all right but as soon as hokel and new york state government was like cannabis is legal her whole perception <laughs> changed of it. it was like oh the government is saying it's okay and so you have this whole demographic of people who were waiting for like the government to kind of say it's okay and now they're going to kind of 
you know, check it out like they do alcohol when you turn 21. You know, not me, 19. I went to Canada just yeah. for the cannabis, the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so it's just, it's beautiful. And I think that that's um, what the state should be doing. Getting that knowledge, figuring stuff out, like learning the terms, you know. It's not the state's responsibility. to. No, no, to... not the state, the community. Well, I think... I, well, if they want to take over a whole underground market, it is their responsibility to educate the public. I think so. I don't know. I feel like if we took the approach that Canada took, that it would be the state's responsibility because they are state run. Um, but I don't think it's the state's responsibility. I'll dis- I'm going to disagree just because they're pushing this out there, right? So that's you have what I these, was. That's you what have I was all these say. legal dispensaries that are essentially sponsored by the state. And then so I buy from a dispensary this time. And next time I'm, I'm at a festival, right? Somebody's got a pop up tent. I don't know the difference between what they're selling me versus what I got at the dispensary. It may not be lab tested. It may not be, you know, the content might be off. And I think, well, I can tolerate this and I buy this. And maybe it's moldy. Maybe it's a myriad of different things. If I'm not educated enough to ask the right questions, New York has essentially put me in harm's way by virtue of saying, you know, it's it's okay. And if you buy it, wherever you buy it from, you have to assume they're licensed, that they're following the same rules, and it's not true. Yeah, you have to empower the consumer. Exactly, exactly. It's tough, though, because if there's, you can really become powered when you, when you look at a COA and you can look at lab results and say, this is the product, this is what's in it, right? And without, you know, even if they said, listen, uh, you know, open up the labs to the gray market, like, you know, it, it, they're talking about enforcement, mitigate enforcement if you're getting your products tested, right? If we could, really, the state should be focusing on in my opinion, public health, public safety, right. and a bit of, of consumer education. And, you know, because it, we, we, we love this plant, but it can be abused just like anything. Exercise can be abused. Food can be abused. I'll Cannabis just, can certainly be abused. I'll throw this out there. Narcan boxes, they're all across the state. There's a whole state campaign to educate people on overdosing. That was a big part of the black community, um, you know, for a long time. And then it started to roll over into all different other communities the sports community the vets community <clears throat> all these different communities because opioids became a real problem right and so now we have this campaign and so i think it should be similar to like that like we're educating people we're not we we just a campaign to educate and it goes back to what greg said just because they're pushing it so hard and they have so much stake in it yep. if they didn't have as much stake in it and they weren't and they were doing it a little differently like we talked about in the beginning of the show no i wouldn't say it's up to new york yeah. right but the way they're rolling it out they're gonna have to be responsible for a lot of programs and let's just shout out that they just got 1.8 million dollars from those card applicants they got a little bit of startup money yeah. They got a little, <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of startup cash. They could start something over there. And you can but, make a hell of a program with a million bucks. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I think so. You know, so part of their cannabis conversations need to be making consumers aware. It is confusing unless you hear a store outright like they're on the news. If you don't if, if you don't know if they're not just straight calling it out, you know, you may go in there thinking they're I mean, I, <coughs> and you know. Steve, you are in New York City, and even in, in Rochester, there's so many sticker shops literally popping up every day. But like, they're out there. You don't know, and um, and I'm I was able to go in there and spot out fake product, right? And I'm like, this isn't this isn't runs. This isn't real runs. What is this? This isn't. This is real cookies. <laughs> Everything's runs right? in New York. I know. Everything is real. <laughs> this is a real cookies. This is a real steezy. Like it wasn't their products. And I know because I've purchased their products from their actual store with their labels on them, you know? And so it, you're getting these fake these fake products and who knows what's in them, especially when you're talking about vapes and stuff, right? Yeah, and, it brings and, us, right. Oh, that was like, such an issue a couple of years ago. Yeah. And okay. they did a whole campaign behind it and got a lot of those vape businesses, Joy Blue, yep. all these different blue, jo- all these different brands that are no longer existent in the vape community or in that industry because they were saying how they put you in the hospital. They were bad yep. for your health. They yeah, did this whole like, campaign. I mean, shame on rushing regulation to push things out the door just to right. make some money to then go back and react and be like, oh, sorry, we didn't know. Yeah, and how about a, you do a little research before yeah. you start suggesting? Yeah, and the vape, right. the vape industry really, like the flavored nicotine industry, took the brunt of that, yes. you know, popcorn lung type of thing. But mm-hmm. it came out, it was determined that it was caused by essentially poorly made cannabis extracts that had vitamin E acetate. Right? Then it was form, forming these like oil-based, you know, 
pockets on your lungs and keep giving people lipid based pneumonia. Now, if they would have taken a little bit of time to understand that, they wouldn't have went through and say, it's flavored nicotine. We found our scapegoat. You know, I do think flavored nicotine is a problem. You see all these young kids sucking on these these nicotine sticks, 15, 16 years old. That's a problem. But it's still it's illegal. But I still see just as many kids, you know, sucking on the, you know, these nicotine pens as usual. So it's like, you know, if they would have focused more on how do we make sure that these products that are these cannabis products that are going to be here that people are going to use are safe rather than just, all right, now it's illegal to do this when it really wasn't even related, you know? So I think that was just more of a reactive thing Mm -hmm. that the state tends to do instead of saying, let's slow down. Let, nothing's going to happen overnight. Let's figure out the root cause and actually make sensible le- legislation that makes sense. And we're not really seeing too much of that nowadays. So, And I like that you go into legislation. People have to be involved. A lot of stuff is happening and they're not commenting on it and they're just kind of trying to wait. And, I'll, and you know, you, you can wait, but then if you don't like it, then the only thing that's going to change it is a lawsuit, right? I got to say, though, it's hard to feel like you have a voice when I emailed OCM on March 16th of 2021, and they still didn't email me back. Still no. Mm-mm. <laughs> See, and I'll just say, come out and... and oh, and I, I did. Oh, I will. I was going to say, I, was gonna say, I hate there. to see them bombarded, <laughs> but that's why I invite them to our career summits, which the next one, shout out, is in Buffalo on uh, November 12th. Um, Steve's going to be there. Rosanna's going to be there, I hope. <laughs> be there with thousand. Um, yeah, and, you know, we invite them out. So you guys can ask questions in person of them. So you can actually get their attention. Chris you know? doesn't love me. <laughs> <laughs> you were grilling um, them at that one event downtown I Rochester. Want, yeah. I mean, there's so many questions that need to be addressed and asked. And the language needs to change. Like, they need to shift. Language is important. Yeah, it's not that the state is doing anything wrong. It's that they are misrepresenting what they're doing. Yeah, let's let's be clear that when they say that black and brown people were the ones that were most harmed, right? So they use that language, the people that were most harmed. Black and brown people were the ones that were most harmed by the prohibition of cannabis. Uh, you could be a black or brown person and get arrested in your own neighborhood that was most all black, mostly all black, right? And um and so uh the 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 verbiage and and Marta reflects that, but the actual rollout is not. The people they they're creating these ni- niches where most black and brown people just don't fit, right? They didn't they didn't create a business. And if they did, let's see the numbers. Let's see how many black and brown people applied for card. Um, I would love to know that, and then I would love to know how many black and brown women applied for card. Um, I want to I, I would like to see those numbers just to get a, a actual realistic um take on this because let's be honest black and brown people don't have cultivators licenses not all of them there's very few one maybe, one grower maybe, Nicole, no there's there's more there's more there's okay. i want to say three one but, black male though three yeah there's one black male there's three? nicole nicole is is a woman she's part of canny and then i think there's another one but they're right three, three? i think three out of Farm 250 cultivators. out of right out of is 216 Brittany, and then we're talking about pro- right it could nicole is one of them nicole. i don't okay, okay. I'll, I'll find out though yeah. and then processing I don't know one black processor or Hispanic processor. I, I, no, 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 I'm lying. Bristol Extracts, excuse me. So, so uh, I know that the owner of Bristol Asset Extracts is Hispanic, but I don't know any other ones. I don't know. And I mean, they may be, but I don't, I don't know. But I, that depends on what your definition of social equity is. No, no, no. I'm talking clock. about, I'm talking, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm talking about black and brown people. Yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about social equity. I'm talking about the people when you got locked up for a cannabis charge, that race box that was checked on you was black or brown. Mm-hmm. New York City made almost a half a million dollars in 2020 to guard, feed, and house one inmate. Look one, it up. One Bloomberg. Inmate. One one inmate. So that $50 million would cover 25, let's say, point, almost 26 prisoners, right? So that's a drop in the bucket. We never say, wait, hold up. Let's stop arresting people. We don't got the money for that. We ne- never once it's have I heard the state. It's because it's, it's private Right, and they're making so much money yeah. off of it. So I go to say that, you know, now we're talking about card and we're talking about a loan, we're talking about an interest rate of 14.25%. And we're just talking about how it's being set up. And so it's a, the state is worried about their bottom line again, right? And so where do the black and brown people win in this? Um, it, need, it needs to be addressed in a different manner. Um, the state needs to take a holistic look at it. They need to make sure that they're talking to more of the community and not just specific sex s- sets of the community, right? So you're just, you know, getting these five or 10 people that they feel are prominent in cannabis. Who's to say that they're prominent, right? 
Um, and, and they're not talking to the community as a whole. More of those conversations need to happen. And everyone has the opportunity to raise public comment. Um, I have a link to it in my link tree. It's always up. You have it's 30 days after. But you say that, but that's online. Let's go back to the black yeah. and brown community that were hurt by this. Well, How many of them have laptops in their the homes? Only, right. <laughs> the only free place to remain is the library. So you can go to the library. And I will say that like New York State doesn't have or I'm Erie County, where I'm from, at least doesn't do late fees anymore. You have free access to everything. That's beautiful. Like, the library is that resource in Rochester's library is doing a lot. Mm -hmm. OK, like they now have we're going to really go back to the this. now we're going to go to the graduation rates and the comprehension yeah, level. Yeah. Right. This gets deep. You guys, yeah. this gets deep. even when you talk about cultivation and licensing, it goes deeper than that because we talk about sharecropping as a black person. Right. Jumani's mother was a sharecropper. She's still alive. <laughs> there are black people that are still alive today. Right. That lived through Jim Crow that lived through share, like being a sharecropper. Yeah. So we have to like put this in perspective when because, you know, people like to say, oh, slavery ended so long ago. Yeah. But how many things happened after slavery that just kept black and brown people down? And um, and so when you think about how long Jim Crow has been, not that long. Right. I think 60, maybe a little bit over 60 years. Jim Crow has been, you know, outlawed. And then after that, what came after that. Right. So. Just to saying that things have to be looked at differently if we're saying this is for black and brown people. Yeah. But we're, social equity doesn't just include black and brown people. So right. I want to be clear with that. Right. When when New York talks about social equity, we talk about everybody that was arrested, white men, gay, L LBGTQ, right. Plus all these different things fall under Asian women. All of these different things fall under. So we have to ask ourselves, are we truly meeting the 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 goal of the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation yeah. Act. Because originally right? MRTA came out with BIPOC. It was BIPOC everything. And that was their focus. And then they broadened to social equity, uh, not just BIPOC. And mm -hmm. then it changed over to justice involved. Well, let's read the Office of Cannabis Management. Uh, for uh, the So on their page, the Office of Cannabis Management and Social Equity. The paragraph that they put on here says social equity is central to the cannabis law, which seeks to begin the work of repairing decades of disproportionate enforcement and overcriminalization of cannabis prohibition, especially in black and brown communities, ensuring those harmed are given an equitable chance to participate and thrive. And the legal New York cannabis industry is a key mandate of the cannabis law and a priority of the Office of Cannabis Management. And somewhere else on this website, it says 50% of the licenses will go to social equity applicants. So now they've defined what social equity is. They say that 50% of the licenses, but out of the 200 and the processors and the cultivators, I can't remember the exact, I want to say 60, 262. I think, I'm right, maybe. <laughs> There's 262 licenses out there. How many are black and brown? Majority, yeah, yeah. No, no, there's not even 50% of those licenses that currently exist in New York. 50% of them are not black and brown people. I, mean, I would say cultivation and processing like less than 5%. Right. I have these numbers from the, from, I, it, I actually have a report that tells me that they're a minority owned business. Like that means you have not achieved your goal of equity. That is not what equity is. And shouldn't we be reflecting on that and yeah. like figuring out how we can do better? Right. Before you start rolling out card, before you roll out another conditional, let's evaluate the and first again, round of conditionals. And how many of those are? We don't know. We don't yeah, know right. yet. So we should foil it, like you said. Yeah, <laughs> we could get it. So it's just about making sure that they're that they're really paying attention. I understand that this is hard. It's hard. We see this in other states. Illinois is constantly getting hit with lawsuits. Right. Um, but you, you have to you have to stand true to what you're saying. And you can't it can't be. You know, it's it's only good when it's good for you. It has to be good all the time for for everybody, yeah. right? And so it, it comes down again to the optics for New York State, right? A dispensary, everybody's going to see a face in a store. So if it's if they hopefully meet the expectation of fifty percent, right, that everybody's going to see that. But I'm not going to see a cultivator. It's easy to hide behind the cultivator and the processor because unless somebody holds them accountable and somebody foils the information, who's going to know? Right. They're never going to know. All of OCM's yeah, exactly. pictures from their Croptober tour were all black and brown folks. And and I like OCM. I, I do. don't. I don't. But their social media, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy when they use those memes and stuff. I get really offended. I do. I just I'm like, really? Yeah. Oh, first of all, you're a state organization, so you're for let's be for everybody. Let's not be me, man. And, and I yeah. and I told and I told Steve this. You know the craziest thing about it is I've been smoking cannabis for for right. I'm part of the community, and it's been diverse, 
right? It's only that black and brown people are getting arrested for. But the di- the diversity of the community? You a do, white, you can't a white man helped me perfect my growing, right? Like, was so happy to give me clones and help me. Like, the community is diverse. There's no, there. so so it's just so, so weird. It's when you have <laughs> it feels MSOs. weird. Yeah, it's when you have people that have this stigma, this, like, reefer madness thing that they think everybody's going to be showing up with with a drug rug on. You know what I mean? Like, listening to Sublime. Yeah. And that's just not the market. Yeah, it's the, and it's, you were bringing it up yesterday on the phone. It's like, you know, you go to all these events, legalized New York City. Somebody of every walk of life was in there. Right? Literally. People look like me, like you, like you, like and you. And it was beautiful. Oh, it was amazing. We were all vibing, having a good Everybody time. Everybody was vibing. And like, that's what the culture is. And I think that's it's, the culture. Th- yeah. There's like a lot of, you know, you know, at the state, at the federal level and political, it's a, you know, it's a lot of division and race is a very easy thing to divide it people is. on. And they're very much using it right now to divide us, right? We're just trying to figure out how can we help each other and how can we do business? It's not, I'm white, you're black, you're a woman, you're a man, but let's screw all that. Let's figure out how we can build this as a community, right? Make sure the people who've been most harmed get a fair and equitable chance, right? Give them an opportunity to thrive. That's a very important word that they use that because right now they, there, there is not an opportunity to thrive. Um, and they create generational wealth, which we hear a lot in cannabis, right? You say that. Like, oh, for, for, for a card applicant, if you're successful. Yeah. Um, it's hard to build generational of- wealth on like a 10% margin unless you're a billion dollar corporation. You know. Right. When you're looking at margins and you're bringing in $30,000 a year, that is not a wage that is going to foster generational wealth it's to keep your head above water yeah you know? that, <laughs> it, that it's going to end up being salaried employees can make less than minimum wage and all of these owners are going to end up being salaried employees with the way that they're structured yep. and they're not going to end up making if, if you break it down to an hourly they're going to end up working for pennies yep. for the state essentially because your margins what like effectively they're taxed 70 percent. yeah yeah so yeah and then, and on then top you, of loan you, repayments and lease you know, and yeah, then and when forget you talk your about, house, your cell phone, yeah, yeah, all the things yeah, that yeah. like a regular business would include in their business expenses. But now your government oversight is not letting you use mm-hmm. your personal cell phone as your business write off. Yep. Not saying anyone should do that. No, but and then when you think it. about it, <laughs> when you think about the niche that there are these 906 applicants, you know, because a lot of times I hear, well, they wouldn't have been able to get financing any other way. But when you think about it. And you guys are the experts, but I kind of think that's I kind of think that's BS. I think that if they qualified for card and they had a profitable business during COVID, like for those two years, like all of these things, they would have probably been looking really good for a private investor to invest with in them, and then they would have still owned the majority of their business, and they probably would have gave up a percentage of ownership instead of an interest, right? And so it probably would have put them ahead. And yeah. in, in, in a way, in a sense, right? Because there's a lot of, and, and, and I'm not saying, I mean, as a business owner, I feel like you should be able to control that for yourself, right? And if you own the majority of your business and somebody comes along and is like, Steve, I got $3 million for you. I want 10% of your business. That might be okay for you. And it might be the leg up that you need to get ahead in the business. And why couldn't it have been that way, right? Um, so I just say that to say there, there was a lot of options, but the state chose to make the bottom line for themselves, right? <laughs> so classic. The story. Classic. Yeah, classic. Classic New York State. <laughs> but like the Buffalo Bills are getting a new stadium, so don't worry. We can all get our $11 oh, hot Bills. dogs, no worries. Hey, I love a good $17 blue light, all right? <laughs> oh, I love the Look, at, that's the thing, too. You can't you can't talk to them about the yeah. Bills. We're, one thing about New Yorkers is we're loyal, and yeah. I love that. I we're, love united that by the ca- we're united by cannabis and the Bills. That's, that's what you, what's what bring New York New York. <laughs> Just need a dispensary in the, in the stadium. In Bill's and then stadium. You're or or yeah. in the parking lot. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be honest. Honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but this actually, this point brings me to something else is people having interest in dispensaries and in operations and licenses. Because when we started talking about our conversations, I had really read into, you know, who's allowed to own what and what can I invest in? And so it's clearly written that you can have controlling interest in three retail dispensaries, but what about non-controlling interest? What if I'm a 10% owner in a hundred different dispensaries? That's business I want to be in. Why and I'm and why can't you? Why can't you? Right. So along with that, if it was you know, that's that's appealing for investors that maybe would take somebody that is looking at a DASNY loan and a card application and say, ooh, okay, maybe I don't want to go down this route. Maybe I'd rather 
take wait. my yeah yeah for a traditional one and yeah. then you have and and so that's what honestly that's what i probably see happening just from all my research with mso's and bigger brands and what they're doing in other states when they're uh you know approaching social equity app applicants right in massachusetts and california and what's happening there and it's kind of that they're giving them the option to like they'll pay for their store they'll give them the money to run their store and you can either be here or not and you're still getting paid so wage. they just need a name they just need a name on a piece of paper that's going to hold it. majority and and honestly i don't i mean i know we want we want i want craft i want new york to win but isn't that a way a new yorker could win like yeah why well, so not this brings yeah, us back to the way. conversation of to the community this is a sellout in a business world this is a good opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a black woman in black hair products, that's a common theme. I'll just say it's a, it's a, it kind of goes because when you're, if you're a company and you get big and people are buying a, a Shea Moisture was one that that black um, uh, owner sold their company to a bigger conglomerate. And people are like, oh, you're selling out. Why? Why are they selling out? Because they did. They, they, they created a product that was great. You loved it. They were able to get it in stores and sell it on a mass scale. You loved it. I love Shea Moisture. They, it's awesome. And now they've sold it to a different company and were able to invest in themselves. And now they're rich. Kudos to them. Yeah. And they're able to invest and create another product. Right? You can build and sell every business. That Why you ever can't start? we? That's called. That's what we live business. in. That's, that's right. That's, that's what we want. That's exactly what we want. That's called capitalism. Yeah. I mean, how do you do that, though? So, like, how do I, let's say tomorrow I want to sell my business. How do I do it? Well, it depends mm. on your business. You know, you got to identify a target market that would even be interested. Your value. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it becomes a little more difficult from, like, a brand perspective because, like, trademarking IP is a little bit difficult and there is difficult in this industry. And to really lock up your intellectual property, at least from a brand perspective, may not really be possible right now if you're only cannabis focused. But, you know, if we've seen all the time a lot of big buyouts are happening. Wanna Brands is a great example, right? They have a contingency buyout from Canopy that if... The U.S. goes federally legal. They're going to get bought out for two hundred ninety-seven and a half million dollars. Women-owned business. They make gummies, and they're decent. They're pretty good. They have huge distribution in about eight to ten years of business. But that can happen to any other business. You you're known for making infused, you know, apple cider, and you're the best at it. Maybe you get bought out for ten million dollars in three years. That that's going to happen. People are going to pay huge amounts of money for your intellectual property, and if you're a small business. You should consider selling it. If, but this is where ancillary businesses and private people like us can come in and say, this is a good idea for you, right. but you need to do it the right way because yeah. there's a lot of predation going on in this industry too. Mm -hmm. yes. People selling dreams, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, the small businesses are the ones getting hurt. But if they can navigate these complicated waters with good people who are like generally interested, we should be seeing hundreds and hundreds of buyouts, right? I would love if we saw, started to see 10 million buyouts left and right for all these small businesses. That's generational wealth. That yeah. is. And right. The individual yeah. gets to continue to develop their brand under the MSO. Yeah. You still get to have a name and you still get to have your piece of it. Yeah. But and that I feel like it falls into everybody says stay in your lane. Right. This is like a common industry term, I feel like, for people when they're talking about getting into it or developing. It's stay in your lane, stay in your lane. And it's like you can't be blinded to what's happening around you, but yeah. you do need to be really, really good at something before you move on to the next thing. Agreed. Yeah. But you can't be blind to what's happening around you. Yep. Correct. Yeah, I would say, I th and I tend to be one that says to stay in your lane only because as entrepreneurs in a brand new industry, it, as entrepreneurs in any industry, it's easy to, easy to get shiny and, and, you know, object syndrome in this space. It's like, wow, I can make a living doing that and doing that and growing and manufacturing and bookkeeping and accounting. Where do I start? <laughs> I think when you're getting started, Stay in your lane. If you make the best infused cupcakes, make the best. Be known for the best infused cupcakes. And when you crush it and you sell or you're ready to scale, then you get into uh, your infused milkshakes or growing weed. But I do think as somebody who has struggled up until a couple of years ago to hyper-focus, and it was really a limitating fact, a big limiting factor yeah. for me in my business and just personal growth was I was trying to do a million things. And all of a sudden I had this portfolio of 50% completed products. When I started hyper-focusing, all of a sudden things change. And then when you say, okay, now I can put systems in place where this system is making money, it's on autopilot. Now I can start to focus on something else. But more often than not, scaling and putting systems in place involves people and involves capital. Yes. You know, so my advice as somebody who went through it would be to stick, stay in your lane for now, avoid shiny object syndrome because your time to start to, to differentiate and move outside your lane, it'll come. I love that you said it. our favorite products that we use, they're all 
their inner lane, right? Your phone. Some people use Samsung. Some people use Apple. Apple can't be Samsung. Samsung can't be Apple. They're two different products. So when you create that space for yourself, that's when you're going to win and succeed. Um, we, so I love that analogy. That's so good. So we are. Uh, wow, this has been a fun episode. I know. <laughs> we'll have to do this again. Jeez. Um, really good information. I appreciate everybody for making the trip. Um, any closing remarks? Anything you want to shout out? Anything good going on that anybody wants to? I know you got an event coming up. I do. Should I be definitely a good time for uh, shameless <laughs> plugs. Shameless My plugs. My shameless plug. November twelfth at the Seneca One Building in Buffalo, we're doing a career summit. Our career cannabis career summits are in partnership with the Department of Labor. We definitely uh, invite you guys to come out. We have. Um, a lot of just very talented uh, people in there to answer questions and it's for free. It's a free event. So um, it's from 10 to 3. You can find the information on our social media, NYS Cannabis Connect, or on our website, nyscannabisconnect.com. And I'll just say we definitely are a resource for you. Uh, so even if it's not about careers, but it's because you want to know something about regulation, taxes, what we were just talking about with CARD, check out our website. We are a free resource and we're there for you. So thanks. Appreciate that. Oh, geez. I think, uh, I mean, utilize your resources, right? Everyone, we are all a wealth of knowledge at this table. And I think it's fair to say that if any of us were asked a question, we would answer it honestly and openly. Okay. So I think that that's a huge thing. And that's probably where I've developed the most knowledge in the industry um, is connecting with people and not being scared yep. to ask. Ask questions. Yeah. yeah, make sure you ask. And I think it, yeah, I mean, you, you can't be scared to. You got to let, you got to humble yourself yeah. a little bit and know that you don't know everything. <laughs> right. Matter <laughs> and, of fact, our... Uh, cannabis career summits are called catch a contact right just for that simple fact yeah. come down catch some contacts you yeah. never know who you could be sitting next to literally right. oh my god right, yes. right. near so city <laughs> I know huh? <laughs> but like how did I know all of you individually right yeah. right right because we made those connections yeah. like when right. I first started out I reached out to Rosanna she was on our, fir our first um, anniversary of MARTA yeah. right and so she was there and um, and brought her expertise and this is what you have to do you have to connect Find those yep. resources. Don't be scared to ask. Yep. You got well. You got to live in a little bit. You got to be scared a little. You got to be a little uncomfortable because that's the only way we're all going to continue growing. Yep. You got to put yourself out there. But like, there's a difference between being afraid and being uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I, I think to take it further from what Rosanna said, you know, New York State aside, um, this space is unlike any other business space I've ever been around. Everybody is willing to help. Yeah. It is. It doesn't matter if the person sitting across from you is a competitor. You know, if you have a problem, it's a very compassionate industry. Mm -hmm. So to that point, ask questions. Yeah. And by all means, if you're thinking of getting into the space legitimately, do your due diligence. Ask questions. Reach out to people because it, it isn't everything that New York State may play it to be. Not that you can't be successful, but be cautious. Mm -hmm. And again, ask people. Be humble. Yeah. And don't assume you know the answer because mm -hmm. every time you do, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, it only changes. Very. Yeah, there's a, uh, I think we can all agree is there is plenty of pie for everybody in this industry to eat three times over, right? Yeah, so share information, ask questions, be good to people, be kind, don't be a shithead, and you'll be successful and surround yourself by really good people. And uh, I'm lucky enough to surround myself by really great people today. Thank you all so much Thank for you. coming on the Thank show. This you. has been great. Well, uh, this has been a, another episode of Canvas Cum Laude. Uh, Awesome information. It's so exciting that we have so many good people in this space right locally. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks to our friends here at Rockbox Recording and Production in Rochester, New York. They are a full professional podcast and video studio designed by a radio guy for podcasters. Audio, video, voiceovers, editing, whatever. Mouth off at Rockbox at rockbox.com. You can follow Cannabis Cum Laude on LinkedIn and all other social media platforms, as well as Cannabuzz. And if you'd like to help support the show, search up Cannabis Cum Laude on Patreon. And of course, all of those links are in the show notes. Thanks for watching and listening.